as our praise leader Mike shared that uh, the month of February, in honor of it being recognized by the world as a month of love, what we decided to do is we're going to be going over a new four-part sermon series looking at love from a biblical standpoint. Uh, in biblical perspective, in order to uncover what God says about love and how we should be acting it out towards the world. And so for our first week, we're going to look at what kills relationships, because I think this is really important, especially for our married folks. I think we're going to take a look at what kills relationships with a sermon that I've titled The Relationship Killer. Very simple as that, The Relationship Killer. Uh, I get this from actually John Gottman. I don't know if anybody knows him, but this is a quick bio that I got from Wikipedia. And John Gottman is actually uh, an American psychologist. He's also a professor emeritus of psychology at the University of Washington, UW. His work focuses on divorce prediction and marital stability through relationship analysis. John Gottman, Dr. John Gottman is probably one of the premier relationship marital uh, uh, relationship therapists in the United States. Actually, a lot of people seek him out. A lot of famous couples have actually seeked his counsel. And he wrote this book years and years ago called Why Marriages Succeed or Fail. And in this book, he actually talks about four horsemen, the four horsemen of death in all marriages. He has, he has, comp he has compiled all of his research taking all of his experiences as a relationship marriage therapist, he put it all together and he said these four horsemen of the apocalypse, what, what he's uh, of relationships, of the death in relationships, really comes from the book of Revelation. If you all know the four horsemen of the apocalypse is a metaphor uh, depicting the end times in the New Testament. And they describe conquest, war, hunger, and death, respectively. Now, with that being said, the Gottman Institute uses this metaphor of the four horsemen to describe communication styles in marriages that, according to their research, can predict which marriages will fail and which marriages actually go off to succeed. If you're interested in these four horsemen, these are the four horsemen that they have written down. The number one is criticism. In any marriage, if criticism is there, what criticism refers to is actually attacking or putting down your partner's personality or character rather than his or her behavior itself. So let's say your husband does something stupid. Well, most men do stupid things, right? Well, criticism isn't criticism of, oh, you did something stupid. Criticism is you are stupid. Why do you always do that? You're always like this. You're always like that. It's actually a criticism of their character, not their behavior. And when marriages are filled with criticism of each other, John Gottman says that that is one out of four horsemen which kills a marriage. And by the way, this isn't just for marriages. This is also can be applied to your relationships. If you have a friend that is always criticizing and attacking your character, not behavior, but your character, Tell me how long you want to stay in relationship, in friendship with that person. You and I both know not very long. The second four of the four horsemen is contempt. Now, when John Gottman talks about contempt, contempt is any statement or nonverbal behavior that attacks your partner's sense of self with the intention to insult or psychologically abuse him or her. And it puts you, yourself, on the higher ground. So <clears throat> such behaviors 
include like eye rolling, ugh, uh, sneering, name calling, hostile humor, and sarcasm. Once again, this is more about the other person, the spouse, being on the higher ground, always talking down to the other person. Contempt is this attitude of, I'm better than you. The third is defensiveness. Defensiveness is an attempt to protect yourself and to defend your innocence or ward off a perceived, com uh, a perceived attack. So for example, making excuses, cross complaining, and uh, yes, butting are all forms of defensive behavior. When you're feeling under attack, it's understandable that people get defensive. And that is why it's such a difficult habit to break. However, defensiveness barely, it, it, it rarely works because it's really another form of blaming, defensiveness. And then finally, I don't want to park here too long, but finally I want to talk about stonewalling. And I think Asian Americans are really good at stonewalling. I think it's our culture or our nonverbal nature. But stonewalling happens when instead of confronting your issues, with your partner and actually talking to them about it, um, you actually take evasive action and you avoid such as tuning, you either tune out or you turn away and you kind of walk into the other room. Common responses include uh, stony silence where you don't say a word, uh, monosyllabic answers like yes, no, uh, or even grunts, uh, which we, you know, by the judging by the laughter, we all know about that, or changing the subject. There is reluctance to express directly what you are feeling and how uh, you are thinking. And so we avoid by stonewalling. And so all of these, all of these four horsemen, they're devastating to a marriage. Because if you don't learn how to talk to your partner about issues that you are facing, and if you're constantly just turning away and going to the other room and actually not talking about the issue in and of itself, what happens? We see a gap that starts to form. And this is what John Gottman has been observing throughout his storied career. And he is saying that you have these four things well, that's pretty much a death of a marriage. But out of these four, he says that there's one that really stands out. That he says, what, if you have one of this above all the rest, you have almost a 95% chance of divorce. He can actually predict which couples will get divorced within the first 10 minutes of them sitting down in a session. Can anybody take a guess which out of the four is the actual worst? Stonewalling? Well, if we sit here long enough, everybody will get all four of them, right? And we're going to eventually get them right. Do you know that John Gottman actually says the four horsemen of the apocalypse predict an ailing marriage, criticism, defensive, stonewalling, and contempt? However, the worst of these is contempt. The worst is contempt. And I believe this morning that Jesus actually says the same thing. I think if Jesus were walking on this earth right now, I know he's alive and he's on the right hand of God the Father, but I believe he would actually agree with John Cotman's word about contempt. Where do we get it? Let's open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. If we open up our Matthew chap uh, uh, if we open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. This is the part where he actually gives his greatest teaching in all of scripture. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And he's on a mountainside and he's in front of thousands and thousands of people who are listening. 
And after he gives the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor, blessed are the, for yours the kingdom of heaven. After he talks about this, this is the very next teaching that he gives. And he says this to his people. Verse 22. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Now, most of us don't have a, we don't, blat, uh, we don't bat an eye when we read this. Where's Jesus getting this from? He's getting this from the Ten Commandments. God tells Moses, he tells his people through his servant that thou shalt not kill. And so Jesus goes back to the Old Testament and says, guys, all of you, you have heard that it was said you shouldn't kill. But let me tell you something else that I want you to see. And it comes in the next verse, verse 22. Jesus continues by saying, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or a sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, You fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now, for a long time, everyone, I struggled with this verse. I did. When I was in seminary, I remember uh, our professor would talk about this verse, and I'd have a hard time understanding this verse because Jesus here is basically saying, if you call somebody a fool, Look at the last line. Anyone who says you fool, you're going to be in danger of the fire of hell. Well, I don't know about you, but when I was living in New York, most of my young adult life, I called a lot of people fools. And actually, fool was just a small word for another really long curse that I would just continually say and say. And so according to Jesus' words, I, I mean, I stopped here for a moment and said, wait, Jesus, you mean to tell me if I call somebody a fool or a name, I'm going to hell? And I had a really hard time with this. And then I remember I asked my seminary professor, well, look, if everyone who calls somebody else a fool, if they're going to hell, well, then you know what? The Apostle Paul, well, he's in trouble too. Why? Why? Because I don't know if you remember in the book of Galatians, Paul actually says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, you foolish Galatians. Paul says that. You foolish Galatians who bewitched you and who, who tricked you into this false gospel. That's what Paul says in Galatians. So I said to my professor, you know, then Paul would go to hell. I would go to hell, and anybody else in this room who's ever called somebody else a fool, well, you know what? We're all going to hell, aren't we? And then I remember my professor with such wisdom. He said, oh, Howard, 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 you got to look at the Greek word, and you have to understand that it's not just a fool, but this is what he was talking about. Look at this word that I bolded and underlined for you. It's this word, angry. This word, angry. And the word for this is orge, orgizomenos, orgizomenos. It's a, it's a Greek word, orgizomenos, but it's so strong. This word, angry, orgizomenos, is so strong that it only comes out one time in the entire New Testament. In the entire New Testament, it only comes out once. Now, there are seven other deviations of the word, orgizomenos, but basically this word comes to denote this term like such extreme anger that can only be satisfied with wrath. You know that anger? That anger that it, it, it bubbles up inside of you so much that there is nothing else you can do except to actually act out on it and actually hurt somebody. It is out of, it, it says, the Bible says that out of the heart, out of our heart, the mouth speaketh. 
right? And what Jesus is saying is, if you have an anger that is so bad, that is so heavy, that is so blood boiling, that you have to actually let it out by saying, you fool. What he is saying is this anger is not just regular anger. Like, you know, your kids left the Legos on the floor. That's not that kind of anger. What Jesus is talking about is this anger is the type of anger where you shout out to somebody else, I hate you so much that I wish you never lived. I wish you never existed. That's the type of anger that Jesus is talking about here. He is actually talking about the word content. And there are times in our relationships, whether it's our marriages, whether it's our family life, our mothers or fathers, or even friends who have deeply wounded us and betrayed us, there are times in our life where they make us so angry that we actually wished, we really wished in our heart of hearts that they never, ever existed. And this is the type of contempt that John Gottman agrees, and he's seen it over and over again. He's seen the case where people Marriages are devastatingly broken, irreparably broken, because we have this anger towards the other one, and we just can't forgive them. And it comes out in many different forms. Contempt in relationships is basically what I want to uh, present to you all. Contempt is the relationship killer. When you have so much contempt in your heart that everything people do, no matter, even if it's good, have you ever, have you ever had so much contempt for someone that anything they do, like, it doesn't really affect you, but you're so angry at them? For example, like, you can go into the office and you have a boss that you can't stand, and the boss says something really innocuous, like, good morning. And you're thinking to yourself, oh, what is this boss trying to say to me? <laughs> oh, I know this boss is trying to say good morning. He said it with a good morning. It was up and down. It wasn't even right. The way he said it, the way he said it to me wasn't right. And all day long, you're just thinking about how the good morning was not really a good morning, but you're all so like, you know, you're in a fluff. You're just, you're just out of it. You, you can't, everything they do, no matter how nice they are, it never helps. You know, uh, one thing that I'm very lucky to be married to is, is a wife that doesn't like always count the cost. Like, I don't know about you, but there are some, I, I have, I have, uh, a lot of people come to me for relationship advice, and a lot of people actually tell me, look, my spouse or my better half, whatever, they're always counting what I do wrong. Like, I've done something wrong 10 years ago, and she still remembers it even now in 2024. But it was like back in 2014. Do you know those people where they're just like, you know what? Back in, you know, back when we got married, I remember you did this at the wedding. And you're like, what? We were married 20 years ago. And people are always counting the cost. This is one of the repercussions of contempt. You can't forget. And there are times when, I don't know if you've ever, um, you know your wife's upset. Like, there are times when, like, I know Jews really mad. Not necessarily at me or, you know, whatnot, but... If she gets mad, it's interesting, like, I will make sure that the house is clean, I've done all the dishes, you know, I make sure that everything is neat and piled on, like, really well by the time she comes home, and I say, look, honey, <laughs> look, at, look at all these things that I've done for you, and then she goes, well, then why don't you clean the bathroom? 
It's like, what? No matter what good thing I do, if she is filled with contempt because of her job or whatever issue, it doesn't matter. No matter what I do, it will never affect her in a good way. This is the devastating effect of contempt. When you are so mad at somebody and you are so filled with that anger, even a kind hello, even a nice gesture, even though you clean the entire house and spend all your money on doing so, that person cannot see it because they're filled with rage and contempt. So what does Jesus say to the people about this? this relationship killer called contempt. Well, the next verse, Jesus says this, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember, and there uh, remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them and come and offer your gift. What is Jesus saying? He's talking to the people who's about to go and give their tithes and offerings to the Lord. And he's saying to the people, listen, worship, I mean, worship is the greatest form of praising God, isn't it? Today, when Mike and the rest of the band members were singing, especially that song, on and on, and how deep is the love of the ocean of God, I mean, you feel something, right? You, you almost feel like you're out of, there's an out of earth body experience when you're worshiping God. I truly believe for a church, there is nothing greater than, I mean, it's up there with prayer. Prayer and worship for me is like the highest peak of a form of giving glory to God. What is, what is Jesus saying here? Before you even come to worship, if you have a heart that's filled with contempt and you're out there wanting to kill your brother and sister, you're so angry that you wish that they were never alive, you call them fool. Well, you know what? That's an abomination to God. I don't care if we, have, if we give a million dollars to the Lord. If we're doing it with that kind of a heart where we're so angry at the world and you're so angry at the, whoever person there is, Jesus is saying that's an abomination to the Lord. He's saying God won't accept that because it's so, it's, it's so rotten. And this is what happens with contempt and that is why Jesus is telling every person he's giving them a way out. He is saying, leave your gift there. Look at verse 24. Leave your gift there in front of the offer, before, altar, before you even give it to God. Go and make amends to that person. Go and make amends with that person who has hurt you. Go and forgive before you even bring something to the altar. Because with that kind of a heart, with a heart of contempt, God is not pleased with any offering you bring. And so he says, first and go be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. You know, Paul actually says the same thing in different words. Look at what he says in Romans chapter 14. If we look at Romans chapter 14, verse 10, Paul says these words. You then, why do you look? You then, why do you judge? Sorry, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with what? Contempt. Look at that word, that relationship killer. Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or a sister. 
What is Paul trying to tell the Roman church, the church in Rome? He's saying, stop living with contempt because it's going to kill you. And not only is it going to kill you, but look, what we are supposed to be doing is stop passing judgment, meaning stop holding grudges that you have like 10, 12, 20 years ago. We all hold grudges, don't we? I mean, but I mean, what good is it holding on to that day after day? You know, I brought this as a as a uh, reminder. It's a brick. It's a really heavy brick. Um, and this is what Paul is talking about when he talks about don't put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. Contempt is a lot like laying bricks. If you keep holding on to things that you had in like 2020, like in 20, like 10, and you're making an account of every single wrong that somebody else did to you, even a nice hello, you just, it's like you're building Brick upon brick upon brick. I can't believe he did that. I can't believe she did this. I can't believe he did all these things. And you really end up having what you see in front of you. A little wall. A small wall which Paul talks about as a stumbling block. See, the more you remember everybody else's issues and, oh, that person did this or that person did that, you're just laying brick by brick. And what Paul is trying to say is, you get rid of that stumbling block. What is he trying to say? He's trying to say that the answer all lies within you. You see, the person who is receiving your contempt they probably most likely don't know why you're mad. I don't know if you've ever had fights with your spouse, but I think the worst thing I could ever say is, honey, why are you so mad? (laughs) Because you know what they say? Because you should know. I was just like, what? How am I supposed to know if you're not telling me? And this is what we do. We lay brick by brick by brick. You did this to me last week. You did this to me at your mother's house. You did this to me at your grandpa's house. You did this to me on our marriage day, on this wedding day, and this, this, and this. And you start building a wall for yourself that even God will not penetrate. That's why Jesus says, first, go and make amends with your brother. God is not going to break down that wall for you. You have to break that wall down. That's the only way that the other person can come to your side and understand who, where you're coming from. And as long as we are holding grudges, and as long as we are holding this contempt for one another, well, that wall is going to stay up as long as you hold it up. And what Paul is trying to say here is, as you can do your best, instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother and sister. You have an issue with your spouse. You have an issue with your kids. You have an issue with your in-laws or whoever it is it may be. You need to take that brick out one by one. And the way we can do that is through forgiveness. Because otherwise holding all of their issues, holding all of their, all of the things that they did to you. You know what? I could hold this for about five minutes, but you know what? The longer and longer I hold this, the heavier it's going to get. And some of us have been holding these bricks for more than 10 years. How heavy is that? It's killing your relationships. It's killing your insides. And it's making a wall so big that even God can't penetrate it. And in those cases, we have to break down those walls. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.